go back to the original state. If, if I have a, a glass of tea, right, and I stir in the sweet and low or stir in the sugar, now I know some of it will evaporate, but if you leave it sitting there long enough, uh, that sugar will rest back at the bottom uh, after you stir something. But when you change something, amen, that's something that has changed now and forevermore. I want you to leave this place tonight as a changed person. I want the Holy Spirit to encourage us tonight and to speak into our hearts and I want to mention a few instances in God's word tonight where there was a stirring that took place because I do believe in some instances that when we're stirred, if we continue doing what God wants us to do, then we will be changed. But I wanted you to take you to a few instances of scripture tonight where Jesus did not need a stirring. He needed a change. And I want to take you first to the book of John chapter 5. We'll be in John chapter 5 verses 1 through 9. Um, I'll be reading out of the Amplified Version. If you have your Amplified Version or on your phone, you can switch it over to the Amplified Version. Brother Dave on the screen, I believe, will have the new uh, NIV Version, which is pretty close to what I want to uh, read tonight. But here's what I want you to see and what I want you to understand from this passage of Scripture. And we're going to talk about the stirring of the waters at Bethesda. And I want to point something out to you tonight, church. I want you to understand that Jesus Christ does not need the stirring of religious traditions and ceremonies. Come on, hear me tonight. See, we've gotten real good at playing church, haven't we? We know exactly where to say amen. We know how to raise our hands. We know how to lift our voice when the pastor may ask us to lift our voice. We know how to show up on Sundays and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. We know how to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We've learned really good in this century how to play church. But God's tired of the church playing church. He wants us to be the church. Come on now. In John chapter 5 and verse number 1 in the Amplified version goes on and says this later there was a jewish feast and jesus went up to jerusalem and now in jerusalem near the sheep gate there is a pool which is called in hebrew bethesda it had five porticos and in these porticos lay a great number of people who were sick and blind and lame and withered i want pastor dave to put this picture for you up on the screen this is modern day bethesda i don't know if any of you have ever visited the holy land before but this is what you would see when you went on the holy land tour and they took you uh into the area of bethesda this is actually the area and you can uh, see there the, the the five different porticos you can see the area where the water would have been maintained and and the scripture of the lord says uh that at the pool uh, that there was a man who had been ill for 38 years. Come on now. If you're 38 years or younger in here, raise your hand. Hallelujah, I can still raise my hand. This is the last year I can preach this sermon because then I'll be 39. Can't raise my hand anymore. 38 years he had laid there and he had been ill. Listen, I don't like being ill for 38 minutes, much less 38 years. And uh, the word of God says there was a certain man who had been ill there for 38 years. And when Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, knowing that he had been in that condition a long time, uh, you may ask what that particular passage of scripture means. I, th I think that it means this. When somebody is ill, you can look upon them and see that they're ill. I, I believe that when somebody has been sitting there for 38 years without the use of their body, without the use of their muscles, you know it and I know it. When you see somebody that's been laying there not able to use their muscles, their muscles become drawn up, right? Real skinny, skin and bone. Uh, you can basically see their bone through the skin. And so I believe that that's how Jesus knew that this man had been there for quite some time. He knew that he had been sick. And Jesus said, to the man do you want to get well and the invalid answered and i want you to notice this sir i have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up and when i'm and while i am coming then someone else will step down ahead of me and jesus said to him get up pick up your pallet and walk and immediately the man was healed and recovered his strength and he picked up his pallet and he walked I've studied this passage of scripture time and time and time and time again in my time in ministry. 
And I've seen the different viewpoints and I've seen some of the different things that Bible scholars say. And I want you to understand something about the pool of Bethesda. And I can prove it to you in several ways tonight and I will. I believe that the pool of Bethesda did not come from God. I believe that the pool of Bethesda was a pagan ritual. And it was a tribute by the Greeks to a Greco-Roman god of healing by the name of Aclepius. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? I mean, for all my years, I've, I've read that people would uh, come to uh, this water and, and, and the waters would be stirred. In fact, if you look in the amplified version of this, if you notice in your version of the Bible, uh, uh, verse number four may not be there. Okay, does it go one, two, three, five in your Bible? One, two, three, five. A lot of the versions of the Bible, verse number four is not mentioned there. But let me tell you what verse number four says. Verse number four says this, that uh, there was a angel of the Lord that went down into the pool at an appointed time and stirred up the water. That's what verse number four says. You won't find it in a lot of the versions of the Bible. You won't find it in the King James Version. Is anybody reading their King James uh, out there? Is, is, is verse number four, do you, what does it say in there? Go ahead and read it real quickly to me, Brother Harold. Here's what I want you to see about this particular passage of Scripture. In a lot of the early manuscripts of the Word of God, verse number 4 is not there. Verse number 4 comes later. And I, I want to show you that why I believe that this was a pagan ritual. You may ask me about this part of the uh, angel stirring up the waters. And to fully grasp what occurred here, you have to look at the history of the translations. And contrary to popular opinion... Ancient scribes were not always accurate in preserving every little piece of text that they were copying. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you that the scribes made it up. I'm not telling you that the scribes lied. But I am telling you that there are parts of the word that some scribes were certainly not afraid to clarify the issues. And what happened and what occurred here was that uh, the Greeks, when they got a hold of this, they uh, added this uh, scripture, this verse number four, to mention the stirring up uh, of the water. And you may say, well, okay, still, still, I may believe that uh, that passage of scripture was in there from the beginning. So why do you believe that this was a pagan ritual instead of a pool that was put there by God to heal people? Well, let me tell you the biggest reason that I believe this is just a rich ritualistic place. I believe that the healing of God the healing power of God is not just for one person I don't believe God would have done that I don't believe that God would have placed a place there and said well one time every so often I'm going to send an angel down have him stir up the water and then it's going to be a race to see who can get there to receive my healing God would not operate that way he does not operate that way God's healing is available for everyone who believes and has faith and would receive it and we would see here that sick people who were often seen on the porches of the pool of Bethesda they were made up of two types of people Number one, those who came in to try their luck as part of the quest. Uh, maybe they wanted a healing. And, and in case you didn't know this, around Jerusalem uh, and around the area of Jerusalem, there were no fewer than 40 areas just like this, 40 areas dedicated to this God that I spoke of, the Roman Gre Greco God of healing, which was a and they were dedicated so uh, these these people would go around to each of the pools and they would dip in trying to see which one would heal them and it was all dedicated to this greco-roman god so that was one kind of person that would come the other kind of person which i believe was this man here is someone that had already given up all hope for any kind of healing i believe that this man had given up he said that he didn't want uh, to be healed and here's why when Jesus said do you want to be healed what did he say back I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred and while I'm going another step another person gets down there before me 
So when the water was stirred up and somebody would beat him into the water, he got discouraged. He got upset. He got sad. So he sat there all the time. And right in front of his face was to him a promise of a healing. So it was a positive thing. But because he could never get there, it was always a negative thing. So he sat there and he had this positive thought and this negative thought going on all in his mind at the same time. See, this man was there for a long time, as the gospel tells us, in the context of a deeply religious Greek environment. He was a man with a significant personal need, and all of his hope was gone. And Eclepius in Greek mythology was also known not only for his healing and his life-giving powers, but he was known for his attitude of benevolence for the people, which made him one of the most popular divinities in the Greco-Roman world. This is a powerful story to me. And I believe that this entire pool of Bethesda, that it was there as a tribute to a Greco-Roman God and not placed there by God himself. And one of the main reasons why I believe that is this. Do you notice what happens? Now, we read about another pool a little bit uh, later in Scripture, and that pool is called the Pool of Siloam. And if you read about that miracle there at the Pool of Siloam, Jesus tells the person to go into the Pool of Siloam and to wash yourself off and be made clean. But what happens with the pool of Bethesda? When Jesus comes up onto the scene, he tells the man, do you want to be healed? And number one, the man says, well, I have nobody to carry me to be healed, right? He says, if I only had somebody to carry me, which by the way, I've taught you this before, and I'll tell you tonight, if you don't have somebody to carry you to Jesus, you need new friends, amen? This man had lost hope that he would even receive a miracle because nobody was there to encourage him. Nobody was there to help him. And I want to tell you and instruct you tonight, church, we need to get back into an encouraging one another and, and, and carrying one another to a miracle. Listen, you think this coronavirus is just a coincidence? There's nothing coincidental about this virus. The enemy is licking his lips because he's gotten the church separated. Come on now. The enemy is excited because we know that one person, one strand is easily broken. But what does the Bible say about a triple corded strand? It's not easily broken. That's what happens when we come in here together as a body of believers. Well, one can be easily taken. Two is a little more difficult, but can still be taken. But a three stranded cord is not easily broken. A lot of people have looked at the scripture. I could be in the water when it is stirred. Then I could be healed. But what people fail to realize is that Jesus did not need the stirring of the waters to be healed. Come on now. When Jesus walked on the scene, he did not tell the man, hold on just a second, and the angel's going to come down and stir the water. And when he does, I'm going to grab you by the arm. I'm going to put your arm over my neck, and together we're going to walk into this pool so that you can receive a healing. But Jesus walked up onto the scene and he said, I don't need this pool right here because I can just speak your healing into existence. And he told the man, after 38 years, you don't need this water. You don't need this pool. You don't need to wait until the waters are stirred up by this angel. But I'm going to heal you right now just by speaking it out of my mouth. Now pick up your mat and walk out of here. Sickness, which was the symbol of human chaos, it was called into order by the power of Jesus' words. Come on now. I believe that Jesus can just speak it into existence and it'll happen. And I think that there's been some believers that for too long have sat on the side of the pool waiting for the waters to be stirred for our healing when Jesus is the healer. Come on now. We sit back in service and we just wait. Well, maybe someone will give an interpretation of tongues today. Or maybe when I give an altar call and you sit back and you say, well, I'll wait and see if somebody else goes up and then I'm going to follow and I'll go up after them. When Jesus all the time is saying, if you would just come to me, child, I am your healer. I don't need the stirring of the waters. He didn't need the waters to be stirred. He's the one that spoke healing into existence just by saying, be healed, pick up your mat, and walk out of here. The second thing, Jesus does not need the stirring of man's applause. Come on. Just like he didn't need the stirring of the waters that day to heal that man, he also does not need the stirring of man's applause I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 21 really quickly, verses 1 through 11. 
And the scripture says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and they came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, and untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of a burden. And then the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat, Jesus sat on them. And most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut branches, remember palm branches, from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And listen, listen to this here. And when he he entered Jerusalem. The whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus of, uh, from Nazareth of Galilee. I think it's interesting to me that the word of God tells us that they were making such noise that Luke tells us in chapter 19 that the Pharisees in the crowd said, Jesus, can you please quiet these people down? That's how loud they were being. The scripture says the city was stirred. I remember back in 2017, speaking of the Astros, I remember when the Astros won the World Series in 2017. I took my family, I took uh, my wife, and well, Olivia wasn't born yet. Uh, we took Isaac down there. And uh, we went with Pastor Caleb and Milan, uh, who were our youth pastors at the time. And uh, we went down to the parade downtown and uh, watched as the Astros went through downtown. Let me tell you something. There was 750,000 people lining the streets that day. They were hollering. They were shouting. They were throwing confetti. They were cheering. They had air horns. They were slapping hands. They were hugging. And I'm telling you something. When those fire trucks came through that street, uh, it felt like those buildings were shaking and I believe that that's what the Bible meant when it says right here that because Jesus was coming through that the city was stirring it something was happening happening they knew that something was different it's interesting to me that the the Pharisees said Jesus can you quiet these people down and do you know what Jesus said to those Pharisees he said I can quiet them down all that you want me to but if they don't praise me then what the rocks will cry out. So either way, I'm going to be praised in this scenario. Come on now. I don't know about you, and I know every preacher in here has preached this before, but I don't want the rocks to take my place, amen? I want to be the one giving God praise and giving God honor. But the scripture tells us that the stirring in the city had reached deafening levels. It was so loud that they asked him, please make these people be quiet. Ever gone into a crowded place? And you just thought, it is too loud in here for me. I'm out of here, right? They said, please, can you quiet these people down? The whole city was stirred up. Here come Jesus through. You have to understand something. They had witnessed his miracles. Some in the crowd that day still had crumbs from the loaves and the fish that he multiplied on their lips. Come on now. Some of the people in the crowd that day, uh, they were once free, who were, uh, who were bound and not able to travel the mountainside region of the Gerasenes. Now they were free to travel openly because Jesus had healed Legion, the one that was filled with many demons. Some of the people in the crowd that day had witnessed Jairus' daughter come out of that room after they had laughed when Jesus proclaimed that she was merely sleeping. Some in the crowd that day were even in the room as the remnants of a rooftop came crumbling down on their head. And a man was lowered on a mat, unable to walk, but with just the words of Jesus Christ, he was able to get up and carry his mat and walk out of there. There were some in the crowd that day that had been pushed aside as a woman with the issue of blood came down and touched the hem of his garment. They had been celebrating what Jesus had done. They were celebrating the miracles that they had seen. They were celebrating the fact that some of them had just seen him raise Lazarus from the dead. There was excitement. There was anticipation. There was happiness. Some had witnessed miracles. Some had been on that road when, uh, when he walked past a funeral and, and raised a boy from the dead because his mother was grieving. Some had witnessed all kinds of miracles. Uh, when blind Bartimaeus was healed, people were there. And they were the same ones in this crowd this day. 
But don't you find it interesting, as I do, that merely seven days after the city was stirring with support and anticipation, only seven days after the city was stirring and celebrating the miracles that they had seen, that seven days later it was stirring with the cries of crucify him, crucify him. And when given the choice of granting freedom to an innocent man named Jesus or freedom to a thief named Barabbas, the same people that were stirring when he came into Jerusalem on a donkey and cheering him were the same people that were now stirring as they chanted, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And when they were asked, what should we do with Jesus of Nazareth? They stirred again by saying, crucify him, crucify him. Listen, the Lord doesn't need a stirring like we see in this passage of scripture. He doesn't care for us to be excited he cares for us to be changed. Come on now. Listen, the Lord that I serve doesn't need a fan club. He's not Justin Bieber. He's not new kids on the block for some of my old, older people in here. Right? But he's the king of kings and the, he's the Lord of lords. He doesn't need somebody to be his, uh, his, his fan club president. But what he needs is true disciples. Come on now and hear me. What he needs is true disciples of the gospel. I want you to understand and see something here. It's easy for us to cheer and to chant and to applaud after we've seen the miracles that Jesus has done. But don't let us cheer and chant and applaud and then tomorrow get out and live like the world. Come on and hear me tonight. That's what was happening here. They cheered and they applauded. And, and do you know why they cheered and they applauded? The Word of God says this. The Word of God says, uh, look, 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 go back to that verse number 11 again, Pastor Dave, if you can. I want you to see this. And When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city city was stirred right uh and and go ahead verse number 11 the crowds answered uh this is jesus the prophet from galilee of nazareth go back to verse number 10 pastor dave i must have missed it verse number 10 look at this when jesus entered jerusalem the whole city was stirred but look what they said who is this this is so important and i don't want you to miss this tonight these people were cheering from for someone that they didn't even know who it was they were making a big ruckus over somebody that they had to ask, who is that? It reminds me of a time that we were in Hollywood with my family. And I pray my uncle is watching tonight, Brother Willie. We were in a 15-passenger van. And, uh, and we were driving, looking at celebrities' homes. And uh, we, saw, we saw the home of, uh, Lord help him, Ozzy Osbourne. We saw Ozzy's home. And this was back at the time when that show, The Osbournes, was really big on TV, right? So all of us younger guys, uh, as we pulled up to the house, there was another van that pulled up on the other side of the street. And Ozzy's daughter, Kelly, she got out, and she was going into the house. And, of course, all the younger people who recognized her from TV, we were saying, oh, there's Kelly, there's Kelly. And everybody was cheering and clapping and making a big commotion and my uncle Willie was in the front seat and because everyone else was clapping he was clapping too and he said oh there's Kelly there's Kelly and it got quiet in the van and then he said who's Kelly right <laughs> he didn't know <laughs> Kelly who who's Kelly is what he said but just because everybody else was excited and cheering and clapping my uncle was excited and cheering and clapping as well what are you trying to tell me tonight pastor I'm trying to tell you this the Lord doesn't need a fan club he needs disciples he, he, he doesn't need us to cheer and to clap for him. He needs us to follow him. Come on now. He needs us to obey his word and to do what he's asked us to do. They were celebrating everything that he had done. They were celebrating the miracles they had seen. They were celebrating that the fact of all of these things that Jesus had accomplished under their watch, right? But how soon they forgot what he had done. How soon he forgot, how soon they forgot that he had filled their bellies with bread and fish. How soon they forgot that he had raised their loved one or he had healed their loved one or he had provided security by getting rid of the demons in the region of the Gerasenes. How soon they had forgotten and they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Listen, Jesus does not need the stirring of a fan club. He needs the stirring of a church that is willing to be his disciples. Come on. Jesus has become, become a very popular topic today for a lot of millennials. We want to tweet about him. We want to Instagram about him. We want to Facebook about him. But my goodness, people want to Facebook their favorite worship songs. But then I'll see them in the very next day talking about the party that they're going to where they got drunk as a skunk. Come on now. I'm just preaching a little bit to you tonight. 
We see all, everybody that wants to, oh, listen to this song. Listen to this worship song. Here's my favorite Bible verse. And on the very next post, they're dropping F-bombs like you wouldn't believe. Jesus doesn't need a fan club. He needs disciples that are going to follow him. He's not interested in a stirring like this. We talk all the time, and I'm about about to read you a scripture about stirring, right, and what stirring truly is. But we read all the time, and, and people say all the time, oh, we just need the Lord to stir up the church once again. Jesus doesn't need us to be this kind of stirred. He needs us to be changed. I want you to read you 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, and I want to show you what Jesus expects us to be stirred with. He didn't need the stirring of Bethesda. He didn't need the stirring of the people uh, that were uh, crying out as he walked into the city. Why? Why do I say that? Because guess what? Even after he was crucified, what happened? They put him in a tomb and they rolled the, and then the, the, the father rolled the stone away. Amen? He didn't need all of men's applause because God's will was going to be done one way or the other. No matter who cheered him or who booed him. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. How come no one ever names their kids Lois or Eunice anymore? They used to back in the day. And I know that the same faith continues strong in you. Look at this. And this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but of love and of power and of self-discipline. If you were to read the American Standard Version tonight, the scripture says this. You will stir up the gift of God, which is in you. Stir up the gift of God, which is in you. You will rekindle the gift of God that is within you, it says in another version. And that word stir or rekindle in the Greek, it means to fan it up afresh. That which has become little more than a smolder. Bring it once again to full flame, which has become as it is by neglect. Can I read that to you again? Remember, he's instructing us here to fan up the flame inside of you. But look what the Greek means on that. It means to bring against, again to full flame that which has become as it is by neglect. Basically, what this scripture is telling us is this. If we aren't careful, come on now. The fire that burns inside of us will be nothing but embers. Do you remember when you first got saved? I want you to go back with me for just a second. Go back with me to the time that you first accepted Jesus Christ into your heart. I remember when the Lord called me to the full-time ministry. I'll never forget that night. I'm sure anybody else here that's been called to the ministry, uh, that you'll say the same thing. It was in Corsicana, Texas at 16 years old. I was with Brother Bo Melton, who is the son of our pastor of the church in Cleveland, Brother Melton. And Bo Melton and I were teenagers. We were on the softball field in the middle of youth camp. And back in those days, we had church in an open-air tabernacle. We didn't have fancy air conditioning like those kids have now. I sound like an old person now, don't I? We praise the Lord with sweat dripping out of our arms. We used to have church services where snakes would come in. And we'd have men posted on the side of the walls with broom handles to knock a snake in the head. No walls on that thing. Back when the monitors were mean, those dorm monitors were mean. Jessica's grandpa, you didn't want to mess with him, Brother Bays. Alicia's grandma, Sister Miles, you didn't want to mess with her. There wasn't none of this, oh, can I go to the restroom real quick? You would just look back and they'd look at you and say, you better not move. (laughs) 16 years old at youth camp, we would have a bonfire right outside the outdoor tabernacle. And we would go by dorms and we would take these cups that signified the things in our heart that we wanted to give to the Lord. And we would take those cups and we would throw them in the fire and then we would go and we would find a place to pray. And I'm telling you, we would pray for hours. There were kids on that softball field that would be there till two, three, four o'clock in the morning praying. I remember our former uh, superintendent at the time, Brother R.C. Helms, he would sit out there in his truck and let kids pray as long as they wanted to pray. Sit out there with his lights 
making sure the kids were safe. And I was 16 years old praying in the middle of that field. And I remember when the Lord called me to the ministry and said, I want you to go into the ministry. I'll never forget that. And I remember coming back from youth camp. Sister Gatlin came to get us that year. And I remember she came to pick us up from youth camp. And I'm telling you that I wanted to tell everybody on the way home about Jesus. I wanted to write Jesus saves on my pillowcase and put it right on the van window so that everybody could see. When we stopped at Texas Burger in Centerville, I wanted to tell that person who asked me, do you want fries with that? Yes, and do you want Jesus with that? We were on fire for God. Come on, you know, you remember. When were you on fire for God? Remember when that fire burned so brightly that you could not wait to tell someone else what Jesus had done in your heart and in your life? And there's a reason that back in the day we would call it on fire for God. Because we wanted nothing more than to be in his presence. I remember as a teenager in this very church, in the front of this very altar, this very altar probably, in fact, I don't know if we rebuilt these after Ike or not, but I remember Sunday nights where I would come down to these altars and, and, and my grandmother would get down here and pray with me and, and, and we would be in the altars for hours because we wanted to be in the presence of the Lord. Come on now. Sunday night service, we used to just pray for hours. We didn't worry about school the next day. We didn't worry about having to get up and go to work. We were on fire for God, and we just wanted more of him, but something has changed in the church. We've allowed that fire that burns inside of us to dwindle down to nothing more than embers. But to serve God better and to follow him more closely, I, I want you to know that there needs to be a change in our heart and in our life. We wanted to tell everyone about him, but somewhere along the way, we've lost our passion. Our fire that once so brightly for God is now a smoldering embers inside of our heart. And we've slowly but surely let the fire of God burn out inside of us. Come on, tuck your toes under just a little bit. Let me preach this without you getting offended. If you know anything about fires, you know that there's two ways that you can put out a fire. Number one is time. When you leave a fire burning, but you never provide more fuel, come on, then eventually that fire is going to burn out. If I were to set, I told you guys the bonfire, if we were to start that bonfire at the youth camp and never put more fuel on it, then eventually that fire is going to burn out. That fuel is more wood, right? And that fire would burn out. Here's the second thing. Number one, time can burn your fire. Number two, dirt can burn your fire. You can ask any fireman, you can go into a training session and they'll tell you that one of the best ways to put out a fire is by smoldering it. By killing the oxygen. Can I tell on you? We had a fire in our house a couple weeks ago. It was all mom. Thank you. I didn't even have to say it. It was all mom. I began to smell something and I thought something is on fire in here. And I look at the oven. And uh, open it up. Jalapeno poppers, Isaac said. It was. I opened up, <laughs> and that fire was just going. And uh, Alicia's running around the kitchen, right? Oh, grab, grab something, grab something. And, and, uh, and she said this, which is true. Grab some flour. Throw some flour on it. That'll smother it. And it's true. She got that whole big old thing of flour, and I mean she threw it everywhere in there. <laughs> she looked like the sweetest chef off of Sesame Street, throwing flour everywhere. Yes, the cookie man. But listen, we're dealing with a world today that is suffocating itself with the dirt that it allows in its mind and in its spirit. We wonder why our fire has burned out. It's because we've smothered it with dirt. We've smothered it with dirt such as depression and anxiety. Dirt such as addiction. Dirt such as disobedience. Dirt such as hatred. No wonder our fire is burned out because our fire needs oxygen to breathe. And our heart can't find oxygen because we've covered our hearts in dirt. We've stifled our burning desire to know more about God with things of the world. And that fire that once was strong dwindled down into embers. 
But I got good news tonight. The mightiest fire can be revived through embers. Come on now. An ember can rekindle a fire that was once thought extinguished. A few weeks ago, we traveled as a family during this pandemic. We wanted to do a big uh, trip for my parents this year on their 40th year anniversary. And uh, of course, the pandemic uh, put a dent in those plans. And so we decided to rent a little cabin in Wimberley, Texas. And we went to Wimberley. And uh, I was in charge of getting the fire going that night so the kids could have s'mores. And I built a pretty good fire. I was proud of myself. And we went to bed that night. And when we came back outside the next, the next morning and, and gathered around, uh, gathered around the, the, the fire pit, I took the fire poker and I just began to move the embers ever so slightly. And then all of a sudden, poof, here come the fire again. That fire was rekindled because those embers were down there and they were still burning. Listen, I understand that we can lose our fire for God. I understand that temptation and things can take our attention off of him and it can cause us to lose our fire. But the great news tonight is this, church. If you have a relationship with God, your fire and your passion for him can be renewed at any time that you are ready. You may not like it, and it may not feel good, because God's going to take that giant fire poker that he has in heaven, and he might poke us a little bit. He might prod us a little bit, and he may say, Rick, you need to stir this area up here, or you need to stir this area up here. But if I endure what God wants to do in my life, then boom, that fire is going to begin glowing again. It's going to reignite in my soul. So how do we fuel the embers inside of us? How do we get that fire going again? Listen, there's nothing more than I want to see as your pastor than this church burning once again with a desire to be closer to God. I, I, I want to see this church burning again with a desire to see miracles in this place. Come on. That we don't just go through the motions and come in and fulfill our hour, hour and a half for service and then go home the same but that we understand and that we realize that we're in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when he is in something, it changes everything. That people that walk into this place on a Sunday morning, because I know that's when generally most of our congregation comes on a Sunday morning. What a beautiful crowd this morning that we had, amen, all throughout this sanctuary. And I know that most of our congregation just come on a Sunday morning. But I want you to know something, that those that come, uh, they have problems in their life. And we have the answer. And they can receive their answer in the hour that they're here. When they come to these altars and we lay hands on them, things can change. And we need to be reminded of that, church, that we're not just going through the motions here. But that true life change can occur and can happen within these walls. And without going outside these walls as well. When we go outside of these walls, life change can happen. So how do we fuel the embers inside of us? Number one. We need to have daily communication with God. Come on. Listen, I know everybody here tonight either drove a vehicle here or you rode in a vehicle. And if you've ever driven a vehicle or ridden in a vehicle, you know if you keep driving, you're going to eventually run out of gas. And when you run out of gas, you will not move again under the power of that engine until you put more gas in it. On June the 22nd of this year, we were coming home from South Padre Island. And uh, I had my son, I had my daughter, I had uh, Alicia, I had Alicia's sister, Audrey, in the car with me, in the truck. And uh, the man's best friend is the little ding, ding, ding light that tells you when your fuel's low, amen? Amen. Well, my little ding, ding, ding came on and told me that I was running out of fuel. But I like to play a little game called Just How Far Can I Go? <laughs> Just How Far Can I Go? Now, I've gotten Alicia's car before to zero miles to empty, and I was happy, boy. But what I forgot about my truck is I had just put new bigger tires on there. And so my gas sensor was not reading accurately. 
And so I'm cruising on the way back from South Padre somewhere south of Houston. And all of a sudden, my power steering went out and I started to decelerate very rapidly. Nobody in the car knew it because only I was the one that could feel that the power steering had gone out. And I began to pray, sweet Jesus, help me. And we got the car over to the side of the road and I looked at Alicia and she said, what happened? And I said, uh, we've run out of gas. And I got out of the car and I began to pray, God, I don't know where the next town is, but help me make it there. And actually, I probably said, you dummy, you should have gotten gas. And as I walked on the side of that road, I believe that the Lord was speaking to me that, that day. First, I was praying, God, please protect my kids, protect my family. I've seen Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Don't let anybody pull over. And then secondly, I was thinking, Father, just help me get to the next town. However far it may be, help me get to the next town. And I believe the Lord spoke to me. Come on, somebody needs to hear this tonight. I believe the Lord told me in my spirit, Son, things would have been a lot easier on you if you would have just filled up when you had the chance. Come on now. You see everything you're going through right now, the fact that you just had to leave your family unattended alone, none of that would have happened if you would have just filled up 30 miles ago when your wife told you you may need to pull over and fill up, but you said, no, we're fine. And now an 18-wheeler pulled over and some dude said, hop in, you want to ride? To which I said, yes, I don't want to walk another six miles. So he takes me into town. I go into the gas station and I buy a two and a half gallon gas can for $29.99. And as I was checking out, I told that lady, I said, I hope y'all are happy about this. And she probably thought, we are. <laughs> you just paid three hours of my time. I began to fill up the gas can and I began to walk back. Still praying, Father, help me. Help my family be okay, right? And this little old sweet lady pulled over. Now listen, this was right in the middle of the virus. And I thought, there ain't nobody in the world going to pick this boy up. Everybody in the world was terrified that everyone had the virus. And that if you came within six feet of somebody, automatically, boom, you were going to get the virus. So I'm walking down the street thinking, there's not one of these people driving that's going to pick me up. And this little old lady, well, she wasn't a little old lady. She was a little middle-aged middle lady, a sweet African-American woman that had just gotten off of work. She had gotten off of work and pulled me over, and she said, do you need a ride? And I said, yes, ma'am. And uh, she said, get in the car. And I got in the car. And I'm telling you that we didn't even pull off the side of the road before she said, can I tell you about Jesus? <laughs> and I didn't stop her. There was no way in the world I was going to tell her, ma'am, I know all about Jesus and I've been praying to him that you would pick me up. But I wanted that little lady to give her testimony. I wanted that little lady to feel uh, like she was doing what God had asked her to do. And she probably went back to her church on that Sunday and said, I got an old boy saved this week that was broke down on the side of the road. And they may have had a Holy Ghost service because of that and I'm fine with that. But that lady pulling over who wanted to tell me about Jesus, who thanked the Lord, took me back to my vehicle, right? All she wanted to do was to tell me about the Lord. And the Lord was telling me the whole time, somebody hear this tonight, if you would have just filled up when you had the chance, then you wouldn't have had to go through all of this. You wouldn't have had wasted money. You wouldn't have had wasted time. You wouldn't have had to worry about a man in an 18-wheeler driving you off in a back road somewhere or worried about if your family was okay. You caused undue stress in your life because you did not fill up the tank when you had the chance. And if I could build a giant gas tank right in front of this church today, I would tell you, that we have the chance to refuel every single time we come into this house. We have a chance to be refilled every time we come to worship and every time we come to praise. And so why is it church, and it's not just this church in particular, but it's churches all over the land that we just come in and we sit back when God wants us to be refueled. Come on, somebody. So we need to have daily communication with God. And here's the second way. We need to have interaction with the mighty rushing wind. Whew. 
Remember what I told you, we'll put a fire out, smothering it. What brings a fire back to life? Oxygen. Do you remember what the book of Acts says in chapter 2? That when they were in one mind and in one accord and they were in the upper room? That there came a sound from heaven like what? A mighty rushing wind. Hallelujah. In order for the fire to re-spark in your life, you must have oxygen. You have to have wind. And God's word tells us tonight that the Holy Spirit is like a mighty rushing wind. I watched Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure a week ago. And I thought, you know, they have the little phone booth that takes them anywhere in time. And I thought that day, I thought, if I could go back anywhere in time, where would I go? And this day came to my mind. Acts chapter 2. Would you have not wanted to be there that day? Come on, when you're sitting in a room and the Bible says they were all in one mind, all in one accord, and then all of a sudden, right? It just began to blow through the room. And the power of God, hallelujah, came upon them. And they began to speak in unknown tongues, amen. And the world was changed forever. And the church was born that day when the Holy Spirit blew through that room. And that's what we need today. Fire cleanses us. And if I had time to read you 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, it would tell us that fire even purifies. We live in a world that is in a desperate need of a cleansing. Come on. Trash has inundated our society from television shows and movies and music that we're corrupting our hearts with to the fact that just 15 miles south of here lies a city in which a man can use a woman's restroom just if he feels like it. And we're desperately in need of a cleansing. But Jesus knows that underneath the ashes of our misspent life lies divine life-giving embers. And they're just awaiting the blowing of the Holy Spirit i got to tell you tonight, church, Jesus is coming soon. And he doesn't need the stirring of our religious traditions. That's what Bethesda was. Bethesda was a religious tradition to the Greco-Roman God of healing. Jesus doesn't need our traditions. He doesn't need our religious ceremonies. He doesn't need the stirring of man's applause and a fan club. But he needs a true church that is on fire for him, that is desperate for more of him, and that wants to be disciples. Hallelujah. So tonight as we stand all across the room, how do we do that, Pastor? Daily communication with God. And let the Holy Spirit change your life. And I promise you that you'll leave changed. I've grown, I've grown weary when I hear the phrase, well, it just ain't what it used to be. That grieves my spirit and it makes me weary. But the saddest part is, is that's true. Why? We've become distracted. We've become too busy. We've become complacent. We've become lukewarm. But I believe tonight there's some embers that are glowing inside of each of us. That with just a little poking of the Lord... And a little bit of the fire and the, the breath of the Holy Spirit will be kindled once again into a flame. Here's the thing about a flame, and I'm done here. You think about, and I don't know, they may still even be going on. I haven't paid much attention to the news, but I know just a month ago in California it was burning to the ground. It may still be going on. I don't know. But the thing about a fire is if you're not careful, it can quickly get out of hand. But guess what? That's great news for the church. Because if I catch fire, then maybe the person next to me will catch fire. 
Boom, the person next to them will catch fire. Boom, our youth group catches fire. Boom, men's group catches fire. Boom, women's group catches fire. Little Legends is on fire. And before you know it, this entire church is on fire and God is doing miracles. But we need to be rekindled. We need to be changed. And guess what? I can't do it for you. And I can't do it alone. But we must be rekindled and let the fire stir in us. As Pastor Dave plays us some worship music, I just want us to find a place to pray. I want you, wherever you are, if you want to come to these altars, you just to kneel. The Word of God says, search me, O God. Know my